active and where and where she co-directs and where she co-directs an animal studies minor a multidisciplinary program she helped to found Catherine has published essays on class trauma, ecofeminist poetics, and animal studies, focusing particularly on the work of Dublin poet Paula Meehan, and her monograph on Meehan's work in raptured space is forthcoming, forthcoming from West Virginia UP. She's co-editor of Animals in Irish Literature and Culture, which was published in 2015. It includes her essay on the representation of foxes in Somerville and Russ's Irish PM stories. Besides being a scholar and an editor, Catherine is also a poet. She's the author of seven collections of poetry, including three recipients of the North Carolina Poetry Society um, Brockman Campbell Award. And these three uh, collections are entitled The Body's Horizon, Our Held Animal Breath, and Her Small Hands Were Not Beautiful. Um, a newer edition, The Fisher Queen, New and Selected Poems, published in 2019, received the North Carolina Literary and Historical Society's Rowan Oak Chowan Poetry Prize. And Catherine's keynote lecture today is also as you may have guessed, um, you know, directed towards animals and poetry. Um, it's entitled Animal Poetics and Climate Crisis. In it, she will address the role of literary studies in the changing environmental, society, social, and political climates we all find ourselves living in. And she'll explore her own attempts at, as an Irish studies scholar at creative and scholarly intervention. So Catherine, thank you very much for being here with us today. We are very much looking forward to your talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and Maureen and the organizing committee for inviting me here. Um, I'm clearly not going to be talking about birds, <laughs> but this is an act, this actual bear is in Ireland uh, at the time. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm delighted to be contributing to this emerging field. I think maybe we're starting to arrive of animal, Irish animal studies. And really um, thank Maureen again for her book, The Female and the Species, The Animal and Irish Women's Writing, published in 2010. That was a book that was ahead of its time and we're only now beginning to catch up with it. Since reading Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, I've been preoccupied by his argument that the stable climate we've taken for granted for the last several centuries has made it possible to assume a certain way of being human. We constructed a model of human rationality in a natural world we could think of as a stable setting against which human action might predictably unfold. In the face of an increasingly unstable climate, Ghosh doesn't find the conventions of the realistic novel, the other genre in which he works, adequate any longer. I've begun to wonder if something similar might be said of the conventions of literary criticism, mm -hmm. at least for myself. Just as Depeche Chakrabarti has argued that in our era of climate crisis, the discipline of history must reckon with the natural world's agency by putting, quote, geological time and the biological time of evolution in conversation with the time of human history and experience, I have felt a similar need for a literary animal study, a literary studies radically reconstituted by the more than human world. For Gauche, while our new climate reality is not easily accommodated in the deliberately prosaic world of serious prose fiction, poetry, on the other hand, has long had an intimate relationship with climatic events. 
Further, Ghosh suggests that the non-human world may be actively working to revise those habits of thought that are based on the Cartesian dualism that arrogates all intelligence and agency to the human while denying them to every other kind of being. For Ghosh, recognizing the uncanny in human experience is one way of acknowledging the agency of a living earth. Just so, for geophilosopher David Abram, fresh ways of knowing involve reframing psychology as transpersonal and the human mind as one among others capable of meeting with other minds in oak, fur, hawk, snake, stone, rain, and salmon, because all aspects of place make up a particular state of mind. Ghosh's recent The Nutmeg's Curse, a nonfiction sequel to The Great Derangement, he takes among his inspirations the Yanomami shaman Davi Kopenawa, whose memoir and compendu compendium of knowledge, The Falling Sky, witnesses to the ravages of settler colonial terraforming in his homeland, Brazil's Amazonas province. For Yanomami, a shaman's work is to protect the earth. For gauche, writers and artists who include the voices of the non-human in their writing are central to that protection. And such non-human stories can only be told by those willing to transform their own moder modernist conceptions of the human. One of the ways I'm trying as a scholar and practicing poet to bring other ways of knowing and other kinds of evidence to bear on my writing is to integrate more of the associative, intuitive practices of poetry. I call this method animal poetics, and so far I've tried to employ it in two essays I've written about rabbits and hares in contemporary Irish poetry. The guides I've set for myself in this writing include aspirations I may not be able to fulfill in every instance, but I've been guided by the joy I've discovered in this practice, a joy I had begun to lose in the more linear analytic essays for which as an academic I've been trained. I think of animal poetics as more as both theory and practice, both the way a poem represents another animal and the way I try to write about those representations. It's, her, it's a horizon and horizon of an essay might face into without necessarily reaching its goal. What I'm after is a practice that leaves more room for the unexpected, that pins down less and surprises more that aspires in the words of the editors of the Edinburgh Companion to Animal Studies to complicate and reframe an extensive tradition of animal studies scholarship by cultivating new kinds of peripheral attention, improvised imagination, interdisciplinary diplomacy, and interspecies company. Animal poetics is informed by what Josephine Donovan describes as attentive love directed toward animals as moral beings, as subjects in literature and art. My interpretive reading practice finds in the works of many Irish poets a refusal to reduce the animal exclusively to a symbol for purely human concerns. An undermining of our human exceptionalist tradition through poems in which animal lives, including individual animal lives, matter. And a willingness to acknowledge radical differences between species, but at the same time, embrace empathetic multi-species engagements. Donovan contends that such examples of human animal encounter in literature, though much to be desired, are rare. But I've found them among Irish poets. I am then calling animal poetics a creative and scholarly practice that addresses how moving poetry beyond human exceptionalism might change both the writing and reading of poetry. Uh, I have begun this work by following rabbits and hares through poems by, Mike, by Yates, Michael Longley, Paul Muldoon, Sinead Morrissey, and Karen Carson. 
That work encouraged me to develop what I acknowledged as a harebrained practice. <laughs> Willingly going down the rabbit hole to explore a warren of aesthetic, semantic, theoretical, methodological, and ethical choices in which not only human, but also animal lives matter. But now I've found myself in the presence of a very different kind of creature, bears. I'll say more in a minute about how this new species found me and how I am trying to stay with the trouble of being found. Clearly in the current phase of my work, it's dens rather than warrens I'm looking for, and yet the consequences of finding them are a great deal different than finding a rabbit warren or discovering a nest of hares in high grass. From a keystone species that feeds foxes, coyotes, and hawks to an apex predator omnivore, who dines on nuts, berries, and the occasional fawn. Bears are as elusive in Irish poetry as they are in Appalachia. And yet, when they do appear, as in Polymian's The Solace of Artemis, they make an impression. As so often, Paula's poem goes right into the den. In Eamon Walls, the pilgrims emerge from the forest, on the other hand, bears remain on the margin, deep in the woods. I am hoping you can help me locate other Irish poems featuring bears. <laughs> what follows are seven encounters in which a bear emerges, sometimes real, sometimes imagined. The animal companions of St. Bridget the bears, cons bears consider emerging from their winter hibernation in this, our own season, after the Irish festival of Imbolc. Twice in the month of August, I dreamed of black bears. First, I dreamed of scat. Though I'm not aware of ever having seen bear scat on our Appalachian Ridge, my dream image matched some of the dark purplish piles I found online. In the second, the bears had arrived in numbers, taking over a room in our house, curling up on couches and pillows. My dream self wondered if we might need to leave the house to them. <laughs> Later, the bears had gone, the impressions of their round bodies still in the fabrics. I woke to the sensation that the dream was not entirely mine, that I had sidled up to the dream of the earth through some kind of shared language. The next day when I walked early with my colleague Alba on the spine of our ridge, she stopped, ears alert. Then she gave a low growl. Perhaps 20 yards down the trail, peering under an uprooted tree, was a black bear. Smallish, surprisingly long-legged. In one terrifying moment, Alba rushed and I bellowed. I turned back up the path, away from the first bear I'd seen in over 30 years on this land. Miraculously, Alba turned back with me and the bear loped away. I learned later that black bears are three quarters flight, one quarter fight. This one could very well have been an adolescent bear dropped off by her mother because she was too old for the den. She was looking for her place in the woods. Though the wildlife rescue folks told me I need not alter my walking habits, Alba and I avoided the east side of our land in early morning for days. A week later, I heard rifle shots. I wasn't sure I'd ever see the lone bear again. I know that the field of animal studies asks us to include embodied human experience in our inquiry. And because of the mix of genres in which I write, I have long maintained that our feelings are part of the evidence. But what about our dreams? Eco-criticism asks us to entertain the idea of an animate and responsive earth, but our largely rationalist discourses leave us without tools for reciprocal forms of communication with the non-human. How do we go about opening ourselves to such exchanges? 
Creatures of modernity, we thought we could do without dreams and visions, unless perhaps in the confines of our churches or in the genres of our arts. But what if dreams, too, are part of the evidence, and not only in a Freudian or even Jungian sense, but in a pre-modern and indigenous cosmological sense? I'm inclined to think that, I think as a descendant of settler colonialists, my role is to listen without trying to adopt ways of knowing that aren't mine. But I accept the gift of my waking and sleeping encounters with bears as an invitation to ponder what Ghosh describes as the uncanny intimacy of our relationship with the non-human. If the bears are speaking to us, as Suzanne Sumard has suggested, sorry, if the trees are speaking to us, <laughs> the bears are coming later. If the trees are speaking to us, as Suzanne Simard has suggested in finding the mother tree, and if the bears are speaking, as I'm persuaded they spoke to me, what are they saying? For Samard, trees are telling complex stories of multi-species interdependence. With the aid of my microsorial, uh, not a word I ever pronounce quickly, fungi, they engage in communal exchanges that ensure the well-being of the forest. My dreams left me evidence of the seasonal habits of bears, scat turned purple by an autumn diet of acorns, hickory nuts, and berries. But in the second dream, the bears made a den in my home, and just as in my waking encounter, I was afraid. Indeed, part of the grief that emerged from that brief ridge meeting was knowing that neither I nor the bear were safe in each other's presence. There are dogs and there are guns. Black bears are formidable when angry. Yet the dream also contained the uncanny wish that we might somehow live together, a wish I share, even as I know no bear should lose its wild fear of humans. Still, it's hard to know if the hunters in our woods may have shut down a conversation both I and the bear wanted to have. Here are the tenets I've sketched out for writing about other animals and poems. Even as I follow them, I find that the other creatures and my own creaturely self are speaking back. The tenants are under pressure from my practice. A refusal to reduce the animal exclusively to a symbol for purely human concerns. From Levi Strauss's Animals Are Good to Think, to John Berger's Why Look at Animals, to Herzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams, the point is continually made that human imaginative engagement with other animals as symbols has been foundational to human identity and that human art begins with their visual representation. Yet the critical anthropomorphism that makes identification with and empathy for other animals mutually enriching deteriorates when animals become solely metaphors, instrumentally reduced to objects in a symbolic system that may have little to do with the actual creature. As Josephine Donovan observes in her Aesthetics of Care on the literary treatment of animals, an aesthetics of care be here, involves a sympathetic capacity to enter into the experience of another who is seen as a subject, not set apart as an object for ideological or aesthetic manipulation. Two, an undermining of our human exceptionalist tradition through poems in which animal lives, including individual animal lives matter. As Donovan puts it, decentering human perspective is a first step toward relating to the other, whether human or non-human nature as a subject. And animal poetics addresses other animals as themselves affective individuals capable of the kinds of bonds, empathy, and grief we have historically ascribed only to humans. An address of the abyss between human and non-human animal lives such that neither radical differences between species nor empathetic multi-species engagements are denied. 
In the animal that therefore I am, Jacques Derrida names the human practice of homogenizing the differences of all other species besides ourselves as simply animal with the term animo. The term ironically denotes the category humans have made for the primary purpose of constructing our identity in opposition to other animals. But Derrida also observes, I have never believed in any in some homogenous continuity between what calls itself man and what he calls the animal. Animal poetics explores this abysmal rupture between humans and non-humans. An attentiveness to the ways the experience of non-human animal presence shapes the language and the formal devices of a poem. Charging that in its reaction to post-structuralism, eco-poets has so eco-poet poetics has so far focused on poetry as mimetic and given too little attention to the materiality of language. Scott Knickerbocker in the language of nature, the, lang the nature language of nature, the nature of language, calls for a sensuous poesis which attends to the poem's performance of human encounters with the non-human. Sensuous poesis relies on the immediate impact on the senses of the oral effects, such as alliteration, a cacophony, an onomatopoeia, and visual effects, such as enjambment, stanza shape, even as the words simultaneously invite the reflective consideration of the intellect. In Knickerbocker's terms, attending to the body of the poem calls forth our own embodied participation in the human, non-human animal encounters it performs. And here the bar gets really high. <laughs> a willingness to allow the experience of the non-human animal presence to shape the language and form of scholarly inquiry itself, such that the always open-ended nature of human knowledge is named and the profound influence of the more than human world acknowledged. In Hard Day's Night in the Anthropocene, the closing essay of the collection Ecopoetics, Essays in the Field, Joan Ritalik, a poet herself, shakes up the scholarly essay by reclaiming the experimental prosethmetrum, a dialogic genre alternating poet, prose and poetry. She offers this genre -swerving, swerving writing practice because as she says, imaginative swerves may lead to new paradigms that generate ethical energy from constructive optimism. So their Eamon Wall's poem that I'm going to talk about next is uh, on the handout there. Um, and it's it's quite long, so I'm not going to read through the whole of it. Eamon Wall's The Pilgrims Emerge from the Forest represents other animals as protective presences in the founding of his home place, and Escorthy by St. Sinan in AD 510. Commissioned to commemorate the early origins of the town and its church, St. Aidan's Cathedral, the poem was originally intended as a public and communal remembering in the presence of family and friends. Yet it's a poem that refuses a purely anthropocentric narrative. The flora and the fauna attend. These animals matter enough to be represented even if the town's emergence ultimately results in their absence. They are portrayed as benevolent creaturely life that blesses the arrival of human settlement. The poem is understandably, given the context, gentle in its reproof that the habitats of bears and wolves were lost, these species displaced and finally extinguished by the emergence of the ancestors from the forest. When the pilgrims arrive, the bears still live in an untamed land, and they do not intend harm toward humans. Most of what we know so far about bears is that this is the case. Largely, they wish to be left alone. Walls bears even, quote, stand guard while feigning sleep, as if their apparent quiescent ferocity might be to protect from any intended harm to the pilgrims. 
yet they're introduced into the poem by locating them at quite a distance. If the wolves are in the forest deep, the bears are deeper still, obscured farthest in the woodland dark. As in others of Wall's poems, the natural world and the creatures who inhabit it have agency. So even here, in the heart of a commemorative poem, he sometimes obscures and even gently mocks the human actors in favor of representing a multi-species community. Here's what humans do, his poem suggests. Towns are christened, rivers handed names, churches built of wood, are burned to be replaced by stone. In the process, the forest retreats to accommodate the town. Wall's persistent desire to include the wolves and the bears once his poem reaches nowadays, the present, continues with the breath of the wolf and the breath of the bear. On the wind nowadays, we still hear the breath of the wolf the breath of the bear and deer, the breath of oak that carries home to us a whiff of history's odor and brightest spark. Here the lingering presence of the bears involves what David Ferrier calls the quality of experience involving, involved in living in the Anthropocene, where the present is, quote, introduced upon, intruded upon by deep pasts and deep futures. The poem, a point of confluence between deep pasts and deep futures. And it, it, it's really interesting to me that I found in all the references to bears so far, um, that kind of aspect, but given that they aren't actually uh, in Ireland anymore, not so uh, surprising. But the deep past of being you know, quite ancient and the deep future of what may or may be coming. Here's our environmental background becoming foreground and familiarity with deep time recovered in the uncanny temporalities of the uneven and multivalent present. In this sense, Wall's bears become figures who evoke deep time. The bear, like the wolf's absence, is marked by synesthesia. We hear still the breath. The apprehension of the bear in the poem, aural as well as olfactory, the whiff, also a spark, deep time in the present converging. In this way, the absent bear made present. In this convergence of deep geological and evolutionary time with the present appears in my own poem as well. And at a strikingly transformative moment on a threshold in both individual and species life. After the cave Why do I stand unmoved, jaded as a tabloid, refusing astonishment, not down on my knees, but sober as stone? Surely 19th century spelunkers, pranksters, or World War II resistance fighters passing hours in the belly of the mountain made these bison, these bearded horses. But carbon dating brings me to my senses. Whatever I can't take in, 1,500 generations, 32,000 years, here's human memory on the horns of an ibex, our ancestors making it up from scratch. Is it all too near to where I've been, birth and death back and forth across that stuttering line, illness, a long darkness with only a lantern and my love's strong arm, the uneven, the unearthly underfoot? Stalactites make their own sense of water and limestone as I'm to make something wholly new from the dripstone of another life. Just as well we're not as firmly anchored as we think, in the thinned air, the wavering light, easier to find that other self that knows as the animal knows, as the bears in these caves once knew. The first scratches on stone, their marks, beyond light, standing upright on the old riverbed, so that daughters of Adam, sons of Eve, took up what the bears laid down, dark claw on limestone, and drew. This is a narrator struggling to apprehend time across scales. There's a literal resistance to the presence of deep time. 
And yet, as we'll see in Mian's poem, science provides the necessary grounding. While the bears at the end of the poem are actual bears, they are, as in Wall's poem, creatures of the deep past, their presences known nowadays by their remains. The poem undoes human exceptionalism by supplying another species, bears, with an instigating role in the birth of symbol making and human art. The poem's emphatic engagement with the memory of these actual bears and human beings' biological and cultural connections with them inspires the narrator to take a personal leap of faith. There have been moments when our ancestors made it up from scratch, following another animal's lead. Faced with the literal and imaginative leap needed to circumvent our destructive role in climate crisis, in the threshold moment of our time, will we? PowerPoint wants to stay in the cave. <laughs> Though brown bears lived in Ireland for centuries, they disappeared in the last ice age, returning only after the glaciers retreated and before Ireland became an island. Silent scientists seem to agree that bears have been gone from Ireland for 2,500 years, finally arriving, driven to extinction during the Bronze Age because of habitat loss and hunting. Their bones have been found in Irish caves in County Sligo, one of the caves in Ben Bolben, as well as in counties Clare, Cork, and Waterford. But bears are now back in Ireland. At Wild Ireland in Donegal, a local lawyer and passionate rewilder, Killian McLaughlin, is on 23 acres cultivating an emerging 21st century temperate rainforest of 300 planted oaks and other native species such as scotch pine, which had before uh, survived only in County Clare. National Geographic calls Wild Ireland a native animal sanctuary and members of Ireland's former apex predators, wolves, lynx and bears now live there in open air habitats. When McLaughlin declares this isn't a business, I take him at his word. <laughs> the animals are a passion. They aren't caged. They have spaces where they can take themselves away from the visitors. The humans are guests in the animal's home, so it's up to us to spot them in the vegetation. Here, three nine-year-old brown bears have been living since 2020 rescued from the cramped concrete cages of a private Lithuanian zoo with the support of international animal rescue organizations, Nature Aid in Belgium and Bears in Mind in the Netherlands. Though rewilding projects have plenty of critics, I see McLaughlin practicing what ethologist Mark Beckoff calls compassionate conservation a growing global and transdisciplinary field based on the ethical position that actions taken to protect biodiversity should be guided by compassion for all beings. Compassionate conservation stipulates that we need a conservation ethic that prioritizes the protection of other animals as individuals, not just as collective members of populations or species. In this context, McLaughlin's adoption, raising, and naming of three wolf siblings, now named Oshin, Fergus, uh, and Finn, acknowledges each canid as the subject of a life. The bears have names as well, though now there are only two, Donahon and Rinoff, the third having passed away during a routine surgery. Although some, this is the, the cage where they were before they 
uh, came to Wild Ireland. Although some might regard this naming as a form of inappropriate anthropomorphism, bears do have olfactory signatures, and for bears, smell is a sense even better developed than in dogs. Moreover, ursine individuals greet one another. Here's a clip of one of the bears at Wild Ireland greeting a sibling while still in a holding pen after being relocated to the sanctuary. Um, and the music is Wild Ireland's, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Wild Ireland gives its visitors then the embodied experience of deep time. The creatures of Eamon Wall's poem return to the island, though captive, to remind us of what an ethics of care might look like if we accept, as Beckoff urges us to do, that rebuilding is surely part of the process of rewilding. We can't recreate or restore ecosystems to what they were because ecosystems are dynamic entities and develop and evolve in relationship to who is living there and ecological conditions that also vary over time. In addition to rewilding, we also need to talk about the need to rekindle, rebalance, refine, reconnect, re-envision, reintegrate, re-immerse, re-educate, rehabilitate, rethink and reshape our relationships with other nature. Rebuilding habitat and caring for creatures who have been seriously harmed, all sanctuary bears everywhere are recovering from trauma, is the work that I see Wild Ireland attempting to do. Paula Meehan's The Solace of Artemis employs the trope of shape-shifting between narrator and bear to re-envision human and non-human animal futures in the process subverting cultural dualisms between science and art. Written for Iggy McGovern's 2012, 20 Irish Poets Responding to Science in 12 Lines, The Solace of Artemis models for its initial audience, delegates to the Europe, European Science Open Forum in 2012, an undoing of the human-animal binary by using scientific data to revive and recast myth employing the capacity of poetry precisely to offer alternative conceptions of value, to repudiate capitalism's devaluing of human and extra human life, Miam's poem moves us beyond modernity's Cartesian dualisms toward, toward a biocentric vision of human and non-human. In 2015, scientists for the US Geological Survey reported that because of the melting of Arctic ice at the North Pole, Polar bear populations in what is called a directional gene flow are slowly converging on the Canadian archipelago, the 94 islands north of mainland Canada, most likely to have year-round sea ice. The rapid melting of ice and destruction of polar bear habitats is being hastened by temperatures escalating faster at the North Pole than anywhere else. Even though the species is engaged in multi-generational adaptation, the Arctic bears mating and raising cubs closer to the Canadian archipelago each ge generation, the melting of ice could cut off their, these migrations from the Arctic by destroying the uh, ice corridors. Polar bears have become part of a well-established visual discourse in which they at once signify catastrophic climate change and have become part of its collateral damage. By resting her polar bear out of what of that narrative for her 12 line poem, Mian suggests that one strategy human beings might take in the face of climate crisis is to imagine and live into a world where human beings partner with nature's resilience.
and the poem is should be here, but it's definitely on the handout. I read that every polar bear alive has mitochondrial DNA from a common mother, an Irish brown bear who once roved out across the last ice age, and I am comforted. It has been a long, hot morning with the children of the machine. Their talk of memory, of buying it, of buying it cheap. But I, memory keeper by trade, scan time coded in the golden hive mind of eternity. I burn my books, I burn my whole archive, a blaze that sears synapses flaring cell to cell, where memory sleeps in the wax hexagonal, hex, hex, Agonals of my doomed and melting comb. I see him loping towards me across the vast ice field to where I wait in the cave mouth, dreaming my cubs about the den, my honeyed ones, smelling of snow and sweet oblivion. The U.S. Geological Survey study mentioned above uh, confirms that today's polar bears stem from one or several hybridization events with brown bears, while the more than 2,800 samples examined suggest that currently polar bears and brown bears are not mating, Mian's poem imagines a deep future by, retri by retrieving the deep past. Let's see if I can get back to the poem. Ah, the poem is actually absent on the screen, but I'm but I'm glad you have it in paper. I read the poem opens asserting the act that the act of, of taking in new information from the scientific community will be the making of this poem and the new future it constructs. In this opening line, the perfect iambic pentameter of I read that every polar bear alive finds its mate almost match <clears throat> in the nine syllables that follow where the iambic lope ends in other pairings, the double spondee of all DNA. Heavy with the scientific data that has seeded the poem, the grammatical sentence moves across three poetic lines, two of them jammed with a movement that is solid and unstoppable. So, I have more uh, reading of this poem, which I'm happy to do and to continue with. And I also have a closing and it's 10 till five now. <laughs> what shall I do? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. It's open -ended now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm glad I initiated that atmosphere. I hope you are too. Um, um, let's see. Mian has, thus has her audience performed the act of reading and the taking in of new scientific information with her narrator. And then the narrator models not human passivity in the face of climate catastrophe, but instead how readers might respond imaginatively and critically. The poem works its meanings as strong poems do through craft. Unfolding in the present tense, I read, I am. Those first three lines carry readers into the process of the poem's making performing the possibility of comfort rather than despair. In the long view, the polar bears themselves are the result of an adaptation and a strategy for survival. A wily intelligence is at work in the world, a resourcefulness and a resilience. As Mian herself described her response to the scientists' findings about polar bears, in the face of anxiety about our future and that of the many creatures with whom we share this amazing creation, their research offered the comfort of the longer view, the prospect that though we live in cataclysmic times, something will survive. Can we live with the idea, though, that it may not be us? As the lecture, the solace of Artemis reverberates back and forth with the poem of the same name. So the poem is printed in her beautiful lectures that you mentioned earlier this morning, Martin, and it's also the title of her latest book. <clears throat> it's really a foundational poem for her uh, later work, I think. Uh, as the lecture, the solace of Artemis reverberates back and forth with the poem of the same name, we might read the us who may not survive most obviously as the human species and its own coming extinction. Or we might, along with the shape-shifting narrator of Mian's last stanza, 
considered that another way of being human might allow for the human survival for animal survival, human and non-human animal alike. I think she's inviting us to that possibility. It would be a post-human that is not us, but rather an ad adaptive version of us. The shape-shifting gesture is made in Mia's, Mia's lecture as well when she invokes the ancient Greek goddess Artemis, the bear mother in whose protection I place myself, whose solace I profit from, in whose territory I build my den against the coming storm. Elsewhere in the lecture, mothers become mother bears, fathers father bears, the home a cave, this language, a way of evoking an older, wilder relationship with an animal self that might be truly at home in creation, free of dualism. In these ways, Mian integrates scientific evidence into a larger project of healing the Cartesian dualism that the scientific revolution helped to create. The, na the narrator of her poem and the self she performs at her public lecture shapeshift between human and animal, neither human nor animal, but both, by the final stanza, Mian's human narrator has transformed during the course of the poem into a female polar bear who awaits perhaps this time a roving male brown bear, the process of survival begun in another direction. At the liminal threshold of the cave mouth, the narrator positions herself betwixt and between that potent site of transformation and imagines her cubs into another future. Those cubs smelling of snow maintain some aspects of their polar bear mother, but also as honeyed ones possess qualities of their brown bear father. With sweet oblivion, Mian supplies an oxymoron that uh, evokes both a surrender of a separate self to the anticipated coupling, but also the coming loss of an old identity in a hybrid species whose survival is sweet. Profoundly transcorporeal, uh, Mian's shape-shifting poem, The Solace of Mart Artemis, performs the cultural work of repair by re-enchanting the web of life, employing elements of a pre-modern worldview. Such Irish poems also called forth new ways of reading poetry for an Irish animal studies that might contribute to important cultural transformations. So... <laughs> Here's one way this idea has been picked up visually. <laughs> and those are the actual pizzlies or growlers, however you would want to call them, who are, have, are becoming hybridized. And th this is my conclusion. <laughs> Awakened in the middle of the night by serious alert barking, my dogs mean business. I hurry down to the screen side door in time to see a black bear rush my old Shetland sheepdog on the other side of a flimsy screen. Kuig is less wise than my female, more inclined to take anything on, though he comes to me and I take them both upstairs behind the substantial barn door. Then I'm at the computer screen to see how to address this sudden danger, loud noises, okay. The evenings have been hot, even for the mountains, and I can't help, I can't step outside the screen door to shut the outside door because the bear is only eight feet away, shelling peanuts from inside a steel can where I stored them for the crows. I've been careless, forgetting bear's sense of smell. Surely he knows about the dog food only a room away, and their dexterity and strength in unclasping a well-fitting steel lid. Afraid to ease down the stairs again, lest I come between this bear and more food, I pick up the electric toothbrush and hammer the bottom of an empty stainless steel water bowl. Calling with a voice and diction, I must be channeling from a colonial period settler <laughs> from a deepish past. Be on your way. <laughs> I say, surprised that I've chosen to put it this way. Be on your way. So old fashioned, so relatively polite given the circumstances. But somehow it fits my sense that while I, I want him to go, I also know he has rights to this land, that his ancestral line has a far greater claim than mine. Having done with what I could, I returned to bed where my drowsy husband is glad to be done with the racket. 
me knowing the kitchen and its contents are the bears if he wants it. The next morning, we find the peanut bag, which is filled with the shells at the top of some outdoor stairs leading into our woodland trail. A tidy bear. He is gone, leaving everything but that bag, shelled all the peanuts. Like the bears in my dream, he might have come through the door. Like Goldilocks, I know I've made myself at home in his home. These mountain ridges were once home to many black bears. It's we who have eaten their porridge, broken their chair, slept in their bed. Whose land is this and with whom are we sharing it? Astronomers have called ours the Goldilocks planet. The conditions for life are just right. Animal poetics is my way of trying to honor that balance. And then finally, two short clips. Um, at an elementary school in Asheville, two hours from where I live, periodically goes into lockdown when bears visit the playground. <laughs> so I wanted to show you how they respond to this. A bear was taped using the slide then urging her cub down the smaller slide. <laughs> Cuban con commentary in the video is relaxed, empathetic, and playful as the humans share in the fun from a safe indoor distance. This is the kind of human animal interaction my practice of animal poetics attempts to celebrate and foster. And finally, here is my bear, or our bear, um, boldly in daylight, or we are his, and captured by our wildlife cameras loping last October up our ridge. See something off to the east. Thinking, okay, not for me, and gone. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your inspiring talk. I, I didn't know a lot about bears, and I didn't know about the connection. Bears in Ireland. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure um, everyone else is also as intrigued about the topic as I am. So do we have any questions? I, I think we can go a bit over time because we have um, a break. A longer sprint before dinner. So, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, and the fantastic talk, which I think connects so well with what we heard this morning by Martin. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure if you use the term post human restitution. And my question is um, can you emphasis on this kind of post human restitution uh, in contemporary poetry? So, we can see. Um, can this be seen as an attempt to absorb human responsibility towards animals or towards the environmental destruction which is going on? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I, I hope it's 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 teaching, um, you know, a more humane way of living with or being part of that conversation in a small way. You know, um, Nothing is solved, as, as with the wild Ireland. I mean, they're inside enclosures. They can't be allowed to roam. There's no habitat for them. I, other, you know, the 300 oaks are impressive. Uh, it, so, I don't know. I mean, what would you think? You'd no, think I, it could I'm be, yeah. yeah, aside, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think in Anthropocene Poetics, um, Carrier says, uh, or at least quote someone as saying, uh, we can't be um, too hubristic about anything this kind of work can accomplish. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, and I agree with Maureen, that in the Irish poems I have, have really um, found, and, and very much with the rabbits and hares, you really do meet in individual animals. 
And they aren't just symbols. I mean, of course, they're going to be some symbolic charges in the poem, but it's astonishing, really. Um, I I think I don't. I mean, it'd be interesting if I can take this lens other places, you know, and and see. But I mean, I I expect that poet poems are poets are pretty open to this kind of encounter. But um, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, in thinking about, you know, and, and now I will be on the lookout for poems, um, Irish poems with the bear. Thank you. Let you know. But of course, the one that I think is perhaps the most famous bear poem that you know surely is Galway Canals. Yes. Um, and, 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 and here is, of course, a man, you know, you know, tracking a bear. But, but so in a way, it's interesting because it also does deep time because it's trying to go back into the past and then ultimately crawling into the bear skin and kind of merging with it. Um, so, so what do you think of that particular poem in terms of kind of carrying out some of the um, of the you know your, your tenants? Of course, this one's from the nineteen seventies, so it kind of has under a different political agenda at that time. But yeah, I know the poem. I haven't made my mind up about it yet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not clear. I didn't respond to it as immediately uh, relevant because. It does seem to me to instrumentalize the bear quite a lot, and there does seem to be uh, a leaning toward the symbolic value and the the use for the human as a symbol. And so, I think the jury is out on that poem for me. But yeah, and you know, I mean, that's the other thing is is geography and bears. I mean, obviously, they're much more present where I live and in Canada than they are in Europe. Although I I know that there are discussions and conversations about bringing Letting, uh, allowing them to migrate back into Germany. So um, this whole rewilding conversation, I think, is an important one. I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not completely sold on it, but I, th I think it's very interesting what they're trying to do. And honestly, uh, uh, spending time with all the materials that uh, and, and texting uh, so far with Killian, he's quite sincere about what he's wanting to accomplish and. Um, you know, it, he would, he's an easy target, I guess I would say, but if you see the, the footage of how those bears were living before he brought them to Ireland, it's, it's quite distressing. So, I mean, it's, it's a very legitimate rescue operation as well. Yes, more. I have a very simple, straightforward question. Can we talk about that absolutely enchanting nature? And that footage is taken before or after you've had the shots? After. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for asking. Well, that was the most important question. <laughs> thank you. And also for reminding me that there is a little bit of that current of suspense, right? There. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was I was actually, despite the um being terrified some of the time, I was very happy to that, you know, he was there. So now I'm back. Uh, I think my could I ask you a favor? Can you see the bears on the slide again? <laughs> <laughs> the technician. <laughs> Probably we can also send out the link. Yeah. <laughs> Watch it repeat. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's just so fun and it, it's so refreshing that that's the attitude, right? The police aren't called, animal extermination isn't called. You know, it's just like, well, this is we're having our barrels down. It kind of goes on. <laughs> that seriously just happened. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I noticed that when when I was I was doing talks about um, about rabbits and hares too that, that there's such delight when we see these creatures. I mean, and just to be reminded of that that how much they touch our hearts, even in brief moments, you know, is is something. But like all children react to animals mm -hmm. positively. And speak to animals, and animals speak to them. I mean, there's like an innate connection that we have that we are, you know, trained out of stand, yeah, stand yeah. out, yeah. So, um, and being afraid, you talked about the the bears need to retain their fear, and we should retain our fear. I know. Yeah. Bell Plumwood is a famous people critic. 
Yes. And she was almost eaten by an alligator. <laughs> yeah. Know, well, eventually, and she was killed by a snake. So yeah, I know. But, and if she, but that would really look like she survived. The, the right. The, the, the rolling of the alligator. I know. Yeah, I know. I've been talking about it. Be reminded of where yes. you are. Yes. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I think we have this idea that we're all powerful and we can just do what we want, and we are the apex. Of it all. I still the way we are, but it's kind of restoring, you know. Yes, better. and that's the threat, of course. Yeah. Um, and they don't want the wolf, uh, you know. Killing actually has these online inter conversations with the farmers about the wolves because he yeah. would like to see them yeah. uh, back, and of course they wouldn't. And he's it's quite he has quite intelligent remarks to make about it. So. Yeah, and Ireland, they've been trying to. Um, are they? they Pretty successful reintroducing birds of prey. Yes. Of various kinds. yes. But again, there's farmers who are poisoning them, and yeah, you know, it's there's a push and pull. Right. And nothing really good to say about Irish farmers, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, I think it's important, maybe, also to discuss in the context of the video, which I'm happy we saw another time, and um, that. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, we can see those animals behaving very much like we know humans behaving, like yeah. the mom sitting down from the slide, yep. waiting for the baby to come. Yeah. And I guess the reaction or the connection is vastly different if we don't see the animal as much behaving like a human. Um, so as soon as it's not a mammal, for example, it's not yeah. Other, yeah. Yeah. Please, sure, of course. Yeah. Of yeah, course, it's not huge. It's not cute. We aren't right. They're my, they're megafauna, um, but I I do like that that term by uh, Carrie Veal's um, critical anthropomorphism. Right. Mm -hmm. That we don't want. That we also don't want to fall into the the sense that what well, we we're, so, we're so different. We're both so different as species, because um, and Mark Beckoff says this too that having some having empathy and a sense of what the connections are between us, what we do share. Um, nobody told that bear to. Uh, you know, take her cub over to the smaller slide. That that's important. You know, that's important. So, and, and Francis of all has got this term uh, anthropo denial, which is the you know absolute denial that we have anything to do with in common with other animals. So, I I like that more modulated um, uh, approach to anthropomorphism because it's too it can be too easy to dismiss. You know, oh well, that's just anthropomorphic. A mother, you know, loving her child is somehow human. Yes, exactly. It's a problem with certain kind of yes. you know, critique of anthropomorphism. Yes. Yeah. It's like yeah. Animals don't have emotions, animals don't have relationships, animals don't have, uh, you know, moves. <laughs> yeah. 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 All the, the ethologists, I mean, Mark Beckoff finds moral codes within wild wolf cats. He makes it, he's a very serious yeah, yeah, biologist, yeah, but he, yeah. um, it, it's such an interesting, and he's very careful how he makes it because he knows how people are going to uh, respond. But he says there are absolutely moral codes. Yeah. If you don't follow the rules in a wolf pack, you're not going to stay in the pack. And you get given chances, but you know, you, you can't stay if you break too many rules. And so, yeah, so much we have to learn about them. Okay, so if there are no more questions or requests for uh, <laughs> for the video, thank you, Moya. <laughs> I, I would really like to thank you again for this truly inspiring talk. Oh, very much enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you very much. <laughs>